welcome to bbus channel's english section i am intyas patel veriyawala i am one of the host of the english section and bbus is brought to you by community media center bolton uk and as the name suggests it is the channel for communication it is the channel for conversation and our interaction with each other bbus belong to all of us it's about our voice it's about our communication and it's about our conversation with each other today we would like to welcome you to this program called hello can you hear me and we'll be discussing political affairs and politics in the uk as we are approaching towards the general elections and also some area local election as well <coughs> bbus particularly provides platform and a voice for the community and one of the strength we enjoy particularly in this program is that we invite uh, political representatives professionals scholars intellectuals community activists social reformists and we give them series of questions which normally would be submitted by our viewers and listeners in advance in order to find out more details and more information so then after listening to our guest people would be able uh, to kind of digest that information and can make informed choices now we are very fortunate and we would very much like to welcome our very distinguished honorable guest uh, mohtarma yasmin kuresi saiba to our studio uh, welcome madam on behalf of bbus team and on behalf of our viewers and listeners uh, to this program called hello can you hear me now the election is approaching very very quickly and as voters we have certain questions in our mind this is a, this is an opportunity for us to elect what we call the right representative the question is <coughs> what are we looking for in the candidate <coughs> what sort of qualities we are looking at uh, looking in the candidate who aspires to represent us in the parliament or maybe in the council obviously it has to be someone who is aware of our problems and who is aware of our concerns and also who can relate or who can connect with us it has to be someone who give voice to our problems who can give voice to our expectations and who can also fulfill our expectations and aspirations at bbus our policy is to remain absolutely neutral our task is to bring the candidate and the voters together and to facilitate what we call a dialogue between them this is the essence of our democracy and this is the essence and spirit of uh, bbus community media center at the same time we expect various candidates to tell us what their programs are agendas are and how they are going to make our life better we give the medium to candidate we give them space to tell us why they think they will represent us in the best manner the way we would expect them to do so as i said in the studio we have got mohtarma yasmin kuresi saiba from uh, labor party uh, on behalf of labor party uh, uh, your your candidate we have received a few questions from our viewers and from our listeners and these are common questions for all the candidate who are appearing in the program so let me begin asking you that can you tell us something about your background your childhood your upbringing your education please to our viewers and listeners okay Well, I was born in Pakistan in a town called Gujarat, and I came to England at the age of nine with my family, my mother, my brother, and my sister. My father was already here. Um, I was brought up in a place called Watford, just outside London, and I went to the nearest comprehensive school to my home. I then went on to university. I qualified as a barrister. Then I practiced and I did a master's in law. I then practiced as a barrister, and then for two years, I worked for the United Nations Mission in Kosovo, helping to set up their judicial and legal system. Uh, I then went back into private practice. Uh, I've been a governor of a college of further education for twelve years, and that was the tenth largest college of further education in the country. I've also been a school governor of two schools, and I became active in the Labour Party when I was sixteen years of age. and most of my activity up until some years ago was very much within the labor party doing things i did a lot of voluntary legal work as a barrister i was working 
doing a lot of tree work for the <clears throat> Salsa Rights Law Centre. And I was, for a number of years, the human rights advisor to the Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, on a voluntary basis again. Uh, because I really believe passionately in rights, and I'm willing to give up my time to do that particular job. Well, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we have got in our studio uh, Mahatma Yasmin Purisi Saiba from Labour Party. If you would like to ask us any questions or if you would like to make any statements or feedback, you can please uh, call us on our studio number, which is UK 01204435825. Uh, you can also visit our website, which is www.britasianbus.com, or you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp. And once again, very warm welcome to this program called Hello, Can You Hear Me? It's about political affairs and we are discussing politics in the UK. Uh, and my name is Imtiaz Patel, Variyawala. My next question would be, you have partly answered that question, but when did you actually develop your interest in politics? It started when a local councillor came to our school to tell us about what councillors do. And for what she was telling about her work, I was asking a lot of questions. She said to me, look, we're in the middle of our local election. Why don't you come out one day and just watch what we do? And that's, you know, when we knock on doors and you ask somebody how you're going to be voting at the elections for canvassing. And I went out with her and another Labour councillor, and I absolutely enjoyed it, talking to people. There were some people who would tell you how they voted. Some people would actually slam the door on you. Some would say clear off. And some would tell, you know, whichever party... Some were pleased to see you, some were unhappy to see you. But it was interesting because the people talked about issues. Even those who were a bit angry wanted to sometimes get something off their chest. And I found that really fascinating. So I then became active in the Labour Party. And I read around what it does for and what it stands for. And I believe that a lot of the values of the Labour Party were the values that I could uh, certainly uh, ascribe to. And I think actually the values that any human being who has a bit of humanity in them, would actually ascribe to. Right. Uh, would you like to tell us about your contribution to community life so far? You mean about well, have been an MP or generally across the... Generally speaking. Well, my contribution... When I was in... Uh, as a school... When I was at school, I got involved in... Then it was called the Youth Subcommittee of the Community Relations Council in Watford. And we were doing a lot of work with young people, especially those who had sort of fallen out of school. And so we set up a remedial, not remedial, sort of help those young people how to do their CVs, how to fill in, up, how to prepare for interviews. And then as a governor of a college and a school, one of the first things I did, and this is I'm talking about a long time ago, things we now take for granted, which monitors the, you know, how many people or what, um, class or of what uh, racial origin are in specific types of jobs, yes? Uh, up until some years ago, that information was never kept. So you never knew whether in any organisation how the ethnic minority people were performing in terms of uh, the seniority of jobs. When I was Governor of West Hart College, I actually was instrumental in introducing a policy where we started recording exactly how many staff we had at all the different levels according to ethnicity, so that you can look at one hand if there's a problem. Like, okay, one of the things we noticed is there was hardly any senior lectures. In a few lectures, hardly any senior lectures, and certainly nobody in the dean level. So therefore, I said to the board, I said, look, we need to start looking at this. Are we consciously discriminating or unconsciously discriminating? Um, and so, that's sort of the kind of thing that I got involved in. And then I was a human rights advisor to the Mayor of London, I had the responsibility for looking after the human rights issues. And that meant London, as you know, was a big cosmopolitan uh, city, people from all uh, communities. And so, for example, when Iraq war was happening, when civil liberties issues were uh, being questioned, when you know, 90 day detention was being questioned, I was one of those people who were leading a strong campaign against that um, um, and involved in trying to you know, build a coalition across other groups who were interested. And as a barrister who was practicing criminal law, human rights and civil liberties, I was able to do a lot of free legal advice to a lot of people, which, and I represented in the tribunals for which you can't get legal aid for. So I would say that before even entering politics, <coughs> I'd contributed a lot to public life. Uh, as a member of parliament, I have um, constituency office at 60 St George's Road, 
where there are three full-time staff there to deal with casework. So anybody who has a problem, and over the last five years, we've had about at least about 5,000 casework. Uh, I get hundreds of emails a day from people concerned about a particular issue. In Parliament, I've spoken a lot on issues, whether it's halal meat, whether it's the niqab, whether it's Islamophobia, whether it's um, disability, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's crime. You know, because obviously I represent the whole uh, of Bolton South East, uh, not any, you know, and therefore issues like poverty, bedroom tax, education maintenance grant, tuition fees. I've spoken a lot in Parliament about those issues and campaigned vigorously for people. I'm also actively knocking on doors trying to ascertain what people's views are. Um, well, I think you have partly answered my next question, which is, uh, can you mention three most important issues uh, related to the community and to your constituency? Okay. For my constituency, generally, the big issue is about uh, what you call, I suppose, um, living standards. The issue of you know, decent homes, the issue of a proper job, the issue of having good schooling, the issue of being having a health. So I call these the standard of living um, group. And that's of concern to everybody. Then I have a group of people who are concerned about some international issues, uh, be it Palestine, be it Kashmir, and I get a lot of emails on that. I have spoken up in Parliament about the right of Palestinian people. I have criticised the Israeli government for what they've done. I'm on record as having done all these things. On Kashmir, I've criticised the, the Indians and others. I've um, stood up and spoken on behalf of the Kashmiri people, their right to um, self-determination, and obviously for the Palestinian people and what happened in Gaza. To the point, I've spoken so much about it that I have a lot of EDL, UKIP, BNP, and Zionist type of people constantly having a go at me on the blog sphere. But, you know, I'm not bothered about that. So obviously that's a concern, and of course issues related to Islam. Uh, the issue of halal meat came up, the issue of niqab and things like that, religious schools. I'm the only member of parliament who has, stat who has stood in the main chamber of the parliament and actually said that halal meat is actually more humane method of slaughter than the stunning method, and I go into details as to why. I got a lot of grief from the right wing press as well as um, you know, organisations. But I stuck to my gun. Okay. And third thing I do is because individual cases, so when a person has an individual problem, I've dealt with all sorts of problems people have, whether it's immigration, whether it's related to the hospital, whether it's schools. And in particular, one specific case I've been dealing with the last four years came from a lady who lives in Little Lever. It related to drugs which were given to women in the 60s and 70s which led to deformities of many thousands and thousands of babies. They've never had any justice, there's never been a public inquiry on it. Things seem to have been shoved under the carpet. When she came to me, she had a whole bundle of documents about this thing. Right, hi. I looked through the documents and actually realised that there's something uh, really injustice had occurred. So I set an old parliamentary group on Trimidos, this drug is called. There's actually quite a lot of coverage in the mainstream media about it as well. Went to Ted Downing Street, I questioned the Minister, I even raised questions at Prime, Prime Minister's question three times, and with the Health Secretary as well. Eventually, after three years of going on about it, the Department of Health has announced an independent expert panel who will look into this particular drug, what happened, why it was given, which actually affected thousands and thousands of babies who are now in their 40s and 50s. It's been like the, it's called the hidden thalidomide. Mm. And I don't know if people know about the thalidomide was a drug given to women which caused a lot of deformities. Mm. So that's one, although it started with a one case, it actually benefited thousands and thousands of people across the country. And I feel very proud of it that, you know, if nothing else happens, I feel I've done something. Sure. Nice one. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the program called Hello, Can You Hear Me? My name is Imtiaz Patel Variyawala and we are very fortunate uh, to have Mahatma Yasmin Kuresi, Labour Party candidate and MP in our studio, answering to the questions which you have submitted to us in order to find out more about uh, Labour Party, Yasminji, their policies, programs and what they can do, politically speaking, in order to bring prosperity and betterment of life in the community. If you would like to forward any questions, any statements, or if you would like to express any reservations or feedback, please do call us on our studio number, which is UK. 
0302-434-35825 or you can visit our website which is www.britasianburst.com or you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp. Uh, my next question again which has been submitted by our viewers and listeners is that uh, can you give our viewers and listeners three good reasons why they should consider voting for you? Absolutely. Look, elections are about the candidate, but also about the party. At the end of the day, I recognise the fact that I was elected as a member of parliament, not because I'm Yasmin Qureshi, the barrister, but because I happen to stand for the Labour Party ticket. And therefore, recognising that, I suppose you have to look at the issue of your the party. And the candidate personality also comes into it as well. Three reasons why you should vote Labour. Firstly, we're the only party which has said that we will tax people whose homes are worth more than £2 million. And I think I can honestly say that in Bolton South East, I don't think anybody has a home worth more than £2 million, in my constituency. Uh, maybe Bolton West and other areas, yes, but in mine. So they will be paid extra tax on those homes. That money, which we estimate will raise £2.5 billion by 2018, we are going to spend that money purely on the NHS. It's going to lead to 20,000 more training contracts for nurses, 8,000 more GP contracts, training contracts, 3,000 more midwives, and the extra money will be on time to care. So when, for example, in a hospital, you've got elderly or very ill people, they need people to sit with them and spend more time with them than necessary. So we spend on that. And also with social care, because, you know, we've got an aging population now, people live longer, which is good, but it brings challenges of health with it. So we're going to do that. That's the first thing. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to abolish the bedroom tax. The bedroom tax was a tax pounds on people who live in social housing, like council homes or Bolton at home or social housing. If they have an extra bedroom, they have to pay £25 a week. Now that caused problems to three quarters of the people affected by disabled people, people who are unwell, because they need a second room to put all their disability equipment, and they were having to pay this money. So one thing, first thing we're going to do is abolish that. The third thing we're going to do, and it's really important is, you may know that every year the bankers, apart from their salary, get their banking allowance, the bonuses. We're going to tax the bankers' bonus to provide for one million apprenticeship stroke paid jobs for everybody who's between the ages of 18 to 24. And if I can just add on a fourth one, we're going to bring the tuition fees down from 9,000 to 6,000 pounds. I think they are pretty good policies to put forward. But can I then touch on things that affect perhaps the Muslim community? Of course. Or Pacific community, because these affect everybody. We're the only party which has said that if there is an Islamic phobic attack, if somebody's attacked because of their religion, the police forces will be actually making note of that and be marked up as Islamic phobic attack. We're the only party who said that Islamic phobic attack will become aggravated crime. So for example, if I punched you, I might get one month imprisonment, but if I punch you because you're a Muslim, then you're going to get two months. So that's aggravated part, you know, layman's symbol. Um, and we're the only party also, if you look at our manifesto, or ethnic minorities and BME communities, we said we would do a number of different things to alleviate the discrimination and the poverty that exists in minority communities as opposed to the other communities. And we're the only party who has put that as a manifesto commitment. Great. Now, since you have mentioned, since you have mentioned that you are like, uh, you know, passionately also working for the interests uh, and issues for the, for the Muslim communities, uh, and you also mentioned that uh, you raise some serious concerns over, over a number of uh, policies in terms of you know Iraq war and then issues in Kashmir and, and Palestine, and uh, that connects with the Muslim sentiment, of course. Uh, have you all thought of resigning from your party? No, because there's not. I mean, that's. A, I think people said you said. I think that's a completely waste of time. Uh, because it's not my party. I mean, at the moment, if you notice, we are not in government. And in fact, my party is the only one, when the issue of Palestine's recognition of statehood came up in the UN recently, last year, my party, my shadow of uh, Cabinet Secretary for the Foreign Affairs, and my leader said to David Cameron and to William Hay, 
Please, when you go to the UN, Britain must vote for this recognition. The Conservative Party refused to do so. We have actually talked about Kashmir and said the parties should get on with it. So I think on these issues, right, it's a bit silly and childish to sort of start resigning because what we've got to do is, right, the British government, whichever party it is, right, they have a foreign policy which is very similar for most governments, right? There will be some changes. What you have to do is you have to work within the system to get the policies changed. So, for example, in the Labour Party, policy on Palestine is the only one which says, and it pushed for the Tories, the Conservative government, to vote for the UN recognition of Palestine, and the Conservatives refused to do so. Okay. Now, the next question would be, there's a perception uh, uh, from the point of view of ethnic minority communities that you know, if you look at the legal field, if you look at the educational field, if you look, and, and, and particularly now we are talking about politics in the UK, do you think that ethnic minority and particularly women, there's an imbalance in terms of the representation at a local level as well as at a national level? What's your take on it? Absolutely, there is a lack of representation of ethnic minorities across the board in all professions, in all walks of life, as well as politics. And there's a more particular problem of women, ethnic minority women, have it even more harder. And they're even less well represented in the system. And we need to change that. And one thing, for example, you know, in terms of political representation, my party has the most highest number of uh, members of parliament of ethnic minority, highest number of members of the House of Lords, and the highest number of councillors and council leaders across the whole country. So we're well ahead of everybody else. But that doesn't mean that's enough, because we need to have more. It's not enough. We need to at least, I think, if we go by statistical, we should have at least 60 ethnic minority members of parliament, as opposed to, what, about, there are only about eight. 17 at the minute, more than that, but it needs to be a, a much higher figure. Um, there is discrimination, and my party, as I said in the manifesto, recognising that there is a, a structural or organisational, institutional racism or discrimination, we have said we'll be setting up a task force which will look at across all government departments and see how people are on the pay scales and grades. We will be looking actively to see how we can change that. We're going to be looking even in the boardroom and in businesses to make sure there's a proper representation uh, of uh, communities in the middle because we recognise that actually the country has people with loads of talent. And if you, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, don't take advantage of the ethnic minority population who are very enterprising, and you know, you're losing out actually on a whole lot of people with great skills. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching program Bebus. Hello, can you hear me? It's about political, political affairs and UK politics. Uh, our guest today is Mahatma Yasmin Purisa Saiba. Uh, if you would like to have, uh, uh, let, let us have your feedback, then you can do so by either ringing us on our studio number, which is UK, or on 204 You can visit our website, which is www.britagingbus.com, or you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp as well. Just a quick reminder that on Saturday, 4 o'clock, uh, we have invited a representative from the UK or UK party, uh, Mr. Jeff uh, Armstrong. So please do tune in to it, uh, tune, tune into it to get his perspective and uh, his programs uh, around, around politics uh, in, in the UK. Now, nowadays, Yasminji, young people are getting disconnected with a lot of things. Uh, I mean, we might be right or we might be wrong. But certainly when it comes to politics, what's your take on this issue? It's true. I mean, the, the group of people who vote the least are the young. The people who vote the most are the elderly. And I always say to young people that one of the reasons perhaps some of your interests are not recognised is because you don't vote, because parties fool their public and ignore you, which is wrong. But I suppose if at the end of the day, right, it's a system of trying to get the maximum vote, you're going to then try to please the group of people. So pensioners often come up very well because they're the highest group who vote. Now, young people, I think, they may not interest in party politics, but I think they're very interested in political politics in terms of whether it's international stuff, whether it's human rights stuff, whether it's fracking, environmental issues. And I think political parties have got to reach out to the young people because A, they are a future, and I think it's important to understand where they're thinking, and they think differently. You know, you talk about institutional racism or discrimination, 
you probably find among the young, there's less of that. And they're much more, I think, more broad-minded, more liberal about things, and they look at the world in a, in a more broader uh, way. And that's one of the reasons we, recognising the fact that some of our young are not getting a good deal, which is why we've got two very specific policies for young people. There are one million young people who are effectively not working. It's a shame. It's a lot. And that's one of the reasons we have said that every 18 to 24 year will be guaranteed a paid apprenticeship, a paid job like apprenticeship. That's recognising the needs of young. And tuition fee is going to be brought down from 9,000 to 6,000. That is a clear policy that's aimed for young people. Well, one of the reasons uh, we kind of you know tend to gather from young people is that they say that you know there's no inverted comma positive inspiring role model because whenever local election takes place or up to some extent you know parliament election takes place they tend to see that you know a lot of I I I, I have to very carefully to phrase this word but they say we don't we don't act in a mainstream kind of political spirit we always bring the model which in inverted comma has failed us maybe from, from back home. How true is this? Well, I think it was perhaps true some years ago. I'm not sure if it's so much now. I think a lot of people now who are counsellors or becoming MPs are very much people born and brought up, very much part of society here. Obviously, you know, it takes time. The Asian community is still a, a, still a junior community in the sense they haven't been here that long. And I'm sure in due course, as years go by, they will become more entrenched. But what I would say to young people, and I say to everybody who sort of say this, I said, well, if you think the other's not good enough, why don't you yourself get involved? Why don't you take the bull by the horn? Why don't you lead on something? Why don't you get on with it? Instead of talking about it and having 20 people chit-chatting over food, why not actually go out and do something? And that's why I think a lot of young people perhaps don't do enough for them. Enough for them then. Right, that's, a very, that's quite a profound and powerful statement that uh, we have to lead the way. So if we want to change something, then we need to do something about it. My last question to you, Yasmin, is that uh, we have talked to a large number of people uh, in the community about the election. Uh, and from the point of view of what we call the common man and common woman uh, uh, in the street, he or she does not see much difference nowadays between various political parties, whether it's Labour Party, whether it's Conservative Party, whether it's Liberal Party. Uh, more or less, the, the kind of you know, feedback we got is they are all the same uh, when it comes to politics. In what way do you think your party is different than others? It's a comment I've heard a lot. I actually think it's an unfair comment, and I think it's a very unfair judgment. I'll give you an example. In 1997, the Labour Party came into power after many years of Conservative government. One of the first things we did was abolish primary purpose. We also changed the whole of the immigration rules. So therefore, mostly, a lot of people who were here, who had families or spouses, husbands and wives abroad, who were waiting years and years for them to come, actually at a stroke, all that was changed if they were able to be reunited with their loved ones. We were the only party who actually came in and said that, you know, this, if I talk about, say, Pacific community, like the like Muslim community, but it applied to others as well. I'm talking mostly, you know, halal meat in hospitals, in prison, imams in prison. The first Muslim state school came because the Labour Party. Everybody saw that when, before then, they had a long waiting list before they could get to hospital. When the Labour Party came, they went down. Schools were crumbling. We we repaired the schools, we repaired the hospitals, we paid the teachers, we paid the civil servants, we paid the doctors, everybody a proper decent salary. We took a million pensioners out of poverty, we brought in working tax credit, which was given to working parents uh, to allow them to work as well as be able to carry on. We took half a million children out of poverty, we were the short start centres. So let no one tell me there's no difference between the two parties. There's a big difference. And I know a lot of people I talk to said, you know, we're really regretful that Conservatives would come in. Now that you say it might be the past, but even for the future, in the next five, in the last five years, when the Conservatives have been, what have they done? They have given uh, tax cuts to the millionaires. The average family is twelve hundred pounds worse off 
They've cut benefits of the, uh, the disabled. The, the number of disabled people who can claim benefit now is lesser than what it used to be. The uh, number of um, young people who used to claim educational maintenance grant, which is for 16 to 18 year olds, allowing them to be able to go on to do their A-levels or whatever, which is abolished by the Conservative, but we had introduced. And they have many youngsters, right? They, they, they brought in the bedroom tax, and all they've done, the Conservatives have helped their friends in the city. We're the only party who said now, even for new policies that we're going to bring in, I mentioned about the health, the two and a half billion for health, uh, billions for young people, tuition fees down, uh, um, bedroom tax abolished, and real investment in the people. I think, and all the issues about Islamophobia I mentioned, I think there's a, a very good story for the Labour Party of town, and I think there's a big difference between the two parties. Okay, thank you. Last but not least, would you like to convey any message, any political you know, message to our viewers and listeners? Well, obviously I would like you all to vote for me and for the Labour Party, but what I would like you to consider also, 7th of May, is an opportunity to have your say. And I would say, please use your vote, but use it wisely. And I know you've got the UKIP candidate coming next week, or whatever, but I would actually say to people, I have no com observation made to me about the Conservatives, Liberal Democrats or Greens or others, but the UKIP, you've known the statement they've made against Muslims, they've called us fifth colonists, they said we are a threat, that we shouldn't be here, we don't belong to part of this country. Um, and even today, Nigel Farage said he thinks half a million people from Libya are going to come into this country and you know destroy this country. I think UKIP, who play and pander to people's insecurities and vulnerabilities, and they are a racist party, please do be careful of them. Use your vote, use your vote wisely. Thank you very much, Yasminji. Uh, we were listening to Mahathir Mayasmin Kurisa Saiba on behalf of Labour Party about their programs and policies. I'm Imtiaz Patel Varidiawala. Thank you for watching this program. Hello, can you hear me? It's about political affairs and politics in the UK. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, let me just remind you that if you would like to have any feedback, comments to make about our programs, uh, then do ring us on our studio number, which is UK 01204435825, or you can send your comments on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp. Once again, on behalf of uh, Beaver's team, on behalf of our viewers, listeners, we would like to thank Mahatma Mayasmin Kurisa Saiba to come and visit our studio and to share the information. But let me just conclude this program saying that again from Community Media uh, UK Centre's policies point of view, we do not take anybody's side. We just bring the guests and, and provide them a platform and opportunity to share their views, opinions on respective subjects. Today we are talking about elections. You have heard many other candidates. You have heard uh, Yasmin Kurisa Saiba. You will be hearing many other candidates in the future as well. Information is there. And that would help you to make what we call the informed choices. So select your candidate wisely and consciously who can work for you and who can look after you and your uh, future generations. Once again, thank you very much for watching this program with me, Mithya Spital Wherever you are, you look after yourself, happy and make other people happy.